maximum depth of, of nine feet. Uh, anyway, just wanted to show you the controls that were chosen, and these were also uh, surface walks where yellow perch, brown bullhead, and large mouth bass could be found. The summary of our fish tissue results were that, you know, as expected, a lot of pollutants are detected at trace levels, and, and that does happen in fish tissue analysis. Uh, of interest, we we did detect PAHs at low levels at all of the sites except for Miles Pond. So even Little Hosmore, uh, we detected low levels of PAHs in the fish tissue there. Uh, but the levels were so low that only three of the values from all the 75 fish that were collected were above what's called the practical quantitation limit. And this is, this is once the value is above there, then you have confidence that that contaminant is even present. Before that, you basically the, the data might not be used or it's, it's, it, uh, it's given a qualifier as a J. So what we did learn is that uh, PAHs, which most programs don't normally uh, even do analysis for because the fish generally will get rid of the PAHs very quickly. They don't uh, bioaccumulate. But what we did learn is that there's trace levels of PAHs in most of the fish tissue. And this is likely both due to both urban and uh, uh, natural settings uh, from, uh, you know, things like even forest fires could lead to incomplete combustion and some PAHs getting into the soils and sediments. PAHs are also found in many foods that we consume, such as smoked meats, barbecued foods, and even roasted foods. We also found low detections of, of uh, pesticides. Uh, all of these were below EPA screening levels. And we found low detections of metals, uh, all below screening values except for one uh, mercury value found in South Bay. The results of the fish tissue analysis uh, do not require further monitoring or consumption advisories. The Vermont General Fish Tissue Advisory that's in place right now for mercury and PCBs uh, provides guidance on number of fish meals per month, depending on the fish species and individual, and, and that's, that's currently protective for these waters too. We also went out to collect sediment samples from uh, eight sites and analyzed them for PAHs and metals to try to see if anything you know, it was coming out as a real hot outlier. Uh, there were eight different sites in South Bay. Uh, oh no, we did eight sites within the main body of South Bay, and then we targeted the rivers in South Bay also, Barton, Black, and the Clyde River. Our goal was to get four sediment samples at the mouth of each of those rivers. The Clyde River, we were only able to get one sediment sample because the sediment quality was much coarser and, and we need the fine sediment for this type of analysis. Eagle Point was the other one, and as well as Miles Pond and Little Hosmore. So a total of 33 sediment samples were collected and analyzed for the PAHs and metals. And then we took those results and we compared them to what's called sediment quality guidelines. And this, these are guidelines that are kind of used for management decisions Two values uh, that are used, one's a threshold effect concentration, a, a lower, more protective concentration, and the other one is a probable effect concentration. Concentrations below the threshold effect concentration, if you got those, you would consider that there's really no problem and no need for further investigation. If you get levels that are above the PEC, then you know you might need to study the situation more and you know look at, at background and so forth. It doesn't mean that there's an eminent risk to the aquatic resources, but if you saw values that were, you know, several order, you know, several times greater than the PEC, it would certainly be an indication that something was, uh, you know, in need of an explanation or more monitoring. So in South Bay, uh, a total of 17 samples were taken near the mouths and then in the main channel. The Red circle on the far left is Hospital Cove. That's not part of South Bay. And our our sediment results for PAHs, and the good news was we, we didn't see any 
values that exceeded the probable effect concentration at any site. South Bay had uh, sites that exceeded the, the lower TEC level for several PAHs. And then uh, metals analysis indicated that Hospital Cove and South Bay had several TEC exceedances, but the only uh, two metals that exceeded the PEC were uh, nickel at South Bay and Hospital Cove and chromium at South Bay. And these exceedances weren't that high. It wasn't like they were 10 times the PEC. They were just slightly above there. So none of the sediment results were significantly elevated, you know, compared to sites that are, you know, quite contaminated. The results were really reflective of the urban land use and in South Bay and Hospital Cove and past activities such as, you know, the railroad uh, activities within South Bay, I'm sure, have led to some of the higher concentrations that we've seen. So uh, this, you know, fish tissue and sediment chemistry work that we've done, I think, uh, has shown us that South Bay and Hospital Cove do stand out from the other control sites, such as Eagle Point and the main lake of Magog and Little Hosmore and, and Miles Pond as being uh, reflective of urban surroundings. The fish tissue analysis uh, doesn't require further monitoring or consumptive advisories. The causation of these lesions is still currently unknown. However, you know, we do know that contaminants such as PAHs and metals can play a role. And, and we also know that UV radiation could exasperate some contaminants like PAHs and certain metals and even other uh, pesticides. And both South Bay and Hospital Cove have are shallow. They have those contaminants, you know, at relatively low levels. They're not, you know, screamingly high, which is good. Uh, but there's certainly potential for UV induced toxicity there. And uh, some of the next steps that uh, we want to take are, uh, are to continue the monitoring of the brown bullhead fishery, uh, documenting the incidence of, of the lesions in brown bullheads, uh, expand the monitoring into Quebec, places like Fitch Bay, continue to investigate the cause of the melanoma tumors that are being seen both through perhaps genetics work, uh, mass spectrometry, spectrometer analysis, and also determine perhaps if melanomas are related to uh, a virus. So that's our, that's our quick talk, but we certainly have some supplemental slides and are happy to answer any questions. I know I ran through all of that pretty quick, but we were trying to trying to keep it short so that there'd be time for discussion. Thank, thank you, Rick and Pete, for those excellent presentations. I would like to introduce Elo Casey, who's the agency's director of communications, um, and she's going to help facilitate the, the question and answer portion of the agenda. OK, as we go into this conversation together, the first is just Ask everyone to keep it concise. Keep it. Keep your remarks to a minute or so or less. Elle, I, I think you're having some connectivity issues. I'm not sure everyone's able to hear you. We have. have oh. Over 75. I will try to text L um, because I'm not sure she she can tell that she's having the conductivity issues that I believe all of us may be experiencing. Just a moment. And thank you for your patience. Yep. And and Julia helps. I I could read off some questions that I see showing up in the chat. 
that I, I'm happy to do that since I expect uh, most of them, Rick and Pete, are going to be for use, and 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 that way we can um, leave it to the experts to answer the questions. Uh, the the first question in the chat is if the lesions harm the brown bullhead. I don't know, Pete, if that's best put to you. Sure. Um, yeah, I I think they do. <laughs> they certainly uh, can even impact the the feeding. Um, some of the lesions will be in the mouth, but I mean, at the at the end of the day, what's important to understand is this is this is melanoma, so this absolutely can impact the fish. Um, our hope is to study this further uh, because we are concerned for those fish. All right, and the the next question is. Um, are there data or observations of similar levels of lesions in brown bullhead and the rest of Lake Memphremagog? Has any of that data been collected thus far? We have only heard reports. Um, I have some really wonderful folks uh, in Quebec that have uh, shared photos and reports um, of bullhead in Fitch Bay. Um, and as far north as the, the very north end of uh, Lake Memphis Magog in the city of Magog at their beach um, where a dead bull had washed up. People have been catching them throughout the lake. Uh, we had a two year study on the lake uh, with, with full time staff in Quebec uh, an interviewing anglers and they did report them in places like Fitch Bay, which is a similar shallow um, bay with, uh, with, a, with good habitat for bullhead. And, and by say reporting them, you mean that the bullhead in those bay embayments also had lesions? Sorry, thank you. Yes, they, they also have the same lesions that we're seeing here in South Bay. Uh, we do not have any uh, uh, quantitative analysis up there yet. Someday I would like to get up. Um, we were planning on doing that this, this past summer, um, but with the restrictions, we weren't able to cross the border to, to do the research. Uh, Rick, I think the next question is for you, which is, was any testing done for hexavalent or trivalent chromium? Yeah, the the chromium testing was for hexavalent, but uh, but I, I think I want to double check the fish tissue work on that for the metals. I'd be happy to share that with you, Beth, uh, after, after this meeting. I don't want to try to dig into that now, right. but that that's a good question. All right. Um, the next question is about the the first report of lesions in the brown bullhead, which I believe was in in 2012. Um, but would open it up to either of you if you have thoughts about what might have have changed um, that would explain this. Is it climate change, uh, landfill, water levels, other factors entirely? Yeah, I know. Pete, I'll let you jump in, but I know one thought that we had when this first happened, I know some people even was wondering, were wondering if Irene had something to do with resuspending a lot of sediment. I mean, obviously, uh, well, I don't know so much about Hospital Cove, but certainly South Bay with the Black River and the Barton River in it, uh, sediment resuspension, sometimes, you know, more contaminated sediment might be, you know, buried or below the six inches and then things getting disturbed, you can resuspend uh, pollutants, maybe something changed there. Certainly the the habitat for where the brown bullhead hang out, Pete would be more familiar with that, but those that's a good question. And we did spend time thinking about what environmental factors might have changed, even a water clarity change or, you know, uh, South Bay has been cleaned up quite a bit from nutrients, you know, a greater transparency in the water could lead to greater you know, UV uh, induced toxicity, unfortunately. So there are a lot of factors that that could be playing back and forth. I think you hit most of them, Rick, and I, I think there are some questions I can see in the chat that I could maybe address some of the other. Please. But I think you answered that well. Yeah, I was going to say, Pete, maybe we can give, there's a couple of questions about the life cycle of brown bullhead. If they migrate, where they're born, do they sort of spend their entire life in one of these embayments, or is it possible that they're traveling around the lake? Yeah, there, that is absolutely a possibility, and that's what makes this um, a little more complicated. Uh, you know, Hospital Cove is, is connected uh, directly to the lake. There is some 
uh, there is a beaver dam that's usually established, but fish can certainly get in and out of there when they want to. The question I see is, you know, could one be born in South Bay and never leave South Bay? Is absolutely. Um, that is very much a possibility. One could be born in Fish Bay and never leave Fish Bay, but they could also migrate between along the shoreline. Um, one of the fish that we had um, that was reported to us by an angler was actually caught at the falls in Orleans. Um, so that's a long way from South Bay, but there's there is no dam between uh, Orleans and South Bay and Bullhead do travel uh, and they they are fish and fish move around a lot. So it's it makes it very difficult for us to pinpoint um, something that would be a, a site of pollutants. Yep. And Pete and I were just discussing uh, well earlier today and yesterday as we're kind of like stirring the pot on all the information that we've gained. And and you're also kind of like looking for good news. I mean, it could obviously be sobering to see a high incidence of, of lesions on, on a fish, but it does seem that, you know, Hospital Cove and South Bay, these are the only two known high incidence sites. And they do have the attributes of being in shallow waters with a lot of soft sediment. And as Pete will point out, this is perfect brown bullhead habitat too, but we were even thinking like, what other locations do we have in Vermont that would fit the bill for something like South Bay or Hospital Cove? And, you know, we were thinking a little bit of Burlington Harbor or maybe even, or, you know, the Barge Canal or something, but there don't seem to be a lot of these type of, you know, setups for, you know, for a shallow bay in an urban setting that might have all the right players and th th that's assuming that that we've listed some of the players that or one of the you know the players that are involved in this uh but clearly uh uh vicky blazer's uh uh report her discussion you know basically th calls out everything under the sun you know and she really does feel that it's probably going to be multifactorial you know it if you know if if a virus is involved you know, it, maybe it's a virus and UV, or maybe it's a virus and a PAH or metal pollutant or so forth. Uh, I guess what we have to go by is, is where there's a lot of strength in the literature making different connections and then, and then try to tease out our weight of evidence. And I've actually seen some things in the sediment chemistry, how it varies between South Bay and Hospital Cove, where I think it could allow us to maybe move forward and 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 focus on other contaminants a little bit more significantly than others, because uh, PAHs were not an issue at Hospital Cove, whereas the commonality there are some metals in both of these locations that have, in the literature anyway, been uh, correlated with with lesions. Interesting. Um. The next question, I think, Pete, is for you. Uh, are the lesion fish safe to eat, and what should anglers do if they catch one? Well, if you catch a fish with lesions, I'm not going to say they're unsafe to eat, but they don't look very appetizing. I, I frankly wouldn't eat a fish that looked sick, and these fish are sick. Um, that that said, the, the consumption of a, a tumorous piece of tissue itself does not imply that you're going to get a tumor yourself. So I think that what we really focused on is we looked at fish that were healthy and we looked at fish that were unhealthy um, and none of the resulting uh, analyte analysis suggested that these things were exceeding what we would consider unsafe to eat fish. So they are probably safe to eat, but we have uh, recommendations for people that might be more at risk for uh, you know young children uh women of childbearing age we would recommend that they wouldn't eat a lot of meals of this um, i do recommend that people put those fish back when they catch them though it should be pointed out that we looked at other fish species because there are a lot of food spe there are a lot of fish species present in lake memphremagog that are very popular food fishes and we and want to encourage that because fish is a really healthy food in your diet, it's particularly something that can be caught right in your own waters. Um, I think that if we had done this testing on fish from the store, what you'll find is they probably have levels of a lot of these same chemicals that we're seeing present in these bullhead. 
So the the presence itself is something that's yes, it's alarming, but the the levels are not. And that's really important to understand is that fish is healthy. Don't stop eating fish and, and start eating a, a steak heavy diet, because if you start looking at steak, you're probably going to find some problems with that, too. Um, we, we encourage people to go fishing on Lake Memphis Magog and eat the fish. And there's a follow on question there, Pete, too. Are, are other uh, types of fish in Lake, Lake Memphis Magog known to have these lesions? No, they're not. And in fact, this is a good question because there are other fish that have similar uh, behavior that that live on the sediment uh, on the on the bottom of the of the South Bay. Um, we have a lot of carp. There are sucker carp would live their whole life in that South Bay, just like a bullhead could. And we do not see these on the carp that we handle. Um, we have a lot of minnow species that probably never leave South Bay. We look at minnow species. We don't see these lesions on minnow species. We didn't see them in the perch or the bass that we sampled. Um, it's it seems to be isolated in the bullhead and that might lead you to say that there's something besides just a contaminant issue going on and that's where the multivariate questions come into play and things as simple as genetics you know is there something going on with a strain of bullhead we have a lot of questions that we want to answer and i think this project is just getting started uh rick there are a couple questions i see for you uh one is is about vocs and pcas and i'm hoping first for the the lay among us you can identify what those acronyms stand for um and whether or not uh, we've been testing for those and believe that they could be implicated in the brown bullhead lesions um and then there's also a question of if we're seeing any see if we've done enough monitoring to see seasonal effects on any of the different um contaminants that you've been looking at Right. So the first uh, the first question was about VOCs, the volatile organic uh, uh, contaminants. I didn't hear the second acronym. P PCAs? PCAs. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what that acronym is unless it's the per maybe they mean maybe it's the, the PFOS perfluorinated compounds. P that would be PFCs. So yeah, I'm not sure of the second one, but uh, we, we did analysis for, I think, 17 different PAHs, the polyaromatic or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and some of those are uh, semi-volatile organic compounds, so we included those. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure what the other acronyms was. So far, seasonally, we haven't uh, done any work. The sediment layer that we took was in the uh, late summer uh, the late summer of 2019, the fish tissue was collected in 2018. Uh, the sediment layer that was collected represented the first six inches of sediment, which we believe that's where most of the aquatic uh, life interactions occurs in. So it's sort of the most relevant for exposure. Uh, I don't think that would be affected too much seasonally. Water chemistry could be affected seasonally, obviously, uh, different activities going on depending on anaerobic or aerobic activities at at that layer. Uh, but I'd be happy to share the analyte list, which uh, for for sediment was about 17 PAHs and and then it was the priority metals which represent uh, 13 metals. And some of those are, you know, we call them priority metals because they're they could be uh, of of concern for human health risk or environmental risk. But there are yeah. also one thing about the metals, both in sediment and fish, is you know, these metals are naturally occurring. A lot of them are are in the earth's crust at big levels, like something like nickel. So it's not it is important to recognize that these the expectation is to find these in the sediment. It's just at what concentrations you find them at. And maybe maybe building on that point, Rick, there are a number of questions um, from landfill leachate to the railroad to the historic ag use, and sure. wondering that people are wondering if if any of those, um, if any particular land use activity um, has been particularly um, shown to have have a connection with the the types of contaminants you're seeing in the lake. Right. I think I think so far. Uh, the two types of pollutants that, that I was discussing in the sediment chemistry results are the PAHs and, and different priority metals. 
we're we're associated with both the urban surrounding land use and the railroad activity, but I don't want to call the railroad out. Uh, most a lot of that sentiment was remediated, but I think the fact that we we found a one con, you know one sediment sample that was above the PEC for chromium that it's possible that that could be overlaid with past activities there. The, the cleanup levels that they uh, designated for that project are are different and might might have even been higher than the PEC. I'm not suggesting that it was just sort of like a management decisions were made on how much sediment could be cleaned up. But still, what we found in, in South Bay with our sediment work, I would I would certainly say it's not representative of of high levels. They're more reflective of past activities and, and urban land use. We have looked at, at surface water monitoring from the landfill, the required surface water monitoring that they do. And one of the sites is the Black River where they monitor above and below the influence of the landfill. And uh, I was recently reviewing that data again. I'd reviewed it uh, in the past. I think they do two samplings, two seasonal samplings a year. And there weren't any pollutants in there. They do, I believe, the full priority pollutant screen, which might be 126 pollutants, but they also do priority metals. And there's there's a lot of different metals that you could call surrogates to what you might expect to see from a landfill coming out, even something like zinc. And uh, there haven't been any indications that any of those uh, landfill associated type of pollutants are in that surface water monitoring. So uh, nothing nothing that's stepping out as a as a contaminant of concern. Uh, same thing goes with the the PFOS and the leachate that's being uh, sent to the Newport City land uh, Newport City wastewater treatment facility. The monitoring there on effluent concentrations uh, basically indicate that after uh, a dilution of the Clyde River that the levels are below the 20 part per trillion uh, uh, some of, of the five regulated PFAS in Vermont currently. So we'd, you'd really be down into the single, single numbers of parts per trillion. And I have spent time looking in the literature for PFAS, if there's any relationship to that. And and fish lesions or tumors, and and there's not, you know, our greatest concern with PFOS or some of the PFOS in particular are the potential for them to bioaccumulate in fish tissue. And we're watching, we're watching and doing mo the the right type of monitoring to ensure that uh, that risk doesn't take place, or if we reach that level of risk, that we'll we'll make sure that we monitor the fish uh, and work with the Department of Health to. Uh, to put any advisories in place that are needed. Hmm. Uh, Pete, I think this is probably a question for you is, have there been elevated incidents of brown bullhead lesions in other lakes in Vermont? Not to our knowledge, no. Um, we have seen other types of, well, let me be clear. There haven't been other types of uh, lesions that have been identified as melanoma. There are other, um, melanistic spotting on bass. There are some lakes that we see that. We see that in Lake Memphremagog. They see that throughout the country, actually. Um, and recent literature is, um, has pointed to a new virus or a, a newly identified virus in, in the bass, the smallmouth and largemouth bass. So we do see very infrequent, but we do see spotting on bass. And I get reports, but they're not raised tumors like we see in the, in the bullhead. Um, so the word lesion, I, I want to be really clear that what we're talking about with these bullhead is a melanoma, and, and that's a much different concern than these melanistic spots that are probably viral. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the next question is if the incidence of brown bullhead with lesions has changed over sort of the study period, knowing that these reports have gone back 10 years at this point, or has it always stayed in that that 25 to 40 percent range? Oh, oh look, at that. look, it's That's like right. Rick anticipated the question. Oh, good. <laughs> <Can't show that. laughs> good. This would not answer that question. Oh. Uh, I, I do have that data, though. Oh. Uh, 
it, it, this is all of the uh, oh, okay. fish captured between 2014 yeah. and 2020. The trend, it, it varies. It hasn't gone in one direction or the other. Um, what we do see consistently, though, is that we see the larger fish are, uh, it's much more common in the larger fish. So that I hope you can tell the difference in the colors. There's an orange and a yellowish bar, and the orange are the, the fish with lesions. And you can see when they hit about 10 or 11 inches, we start to see that about half of the fish um, that we capture of that size have melanoma. And once we get above that, it, they become more prevalent. That's both in Hospital Cove and in South Bay. Um, we, of course, the sample size decreases pretty dramatically. We don't see as many that are above uh, the 13 inches because they just don't get that big, frankly. Um, but we do see that this is a, a something that is an older fish problem. Um, Can and you, this for is, those of us who are less knowledgeable about fish, how long does it take for a brown bullhead to reach 10 inches? So we've we've done some aging on those, and you're looking at a, a four four or five year old fish for the most part. There's a lot of variation in the ages as well, but it's it's not a real old fish, um, although you do see some that are older. Whereas the perch, which we studied, uh, when they get to be 10, 12, 13 inches, those can be some pretty old fish. You know, you're talking 10 plus years. So um, when you don't see uh, melanoma in those fish, which are the most commonly eaten fish, and the, the, the analytes come back with lower levels, it gives you some confidence that it's not just a, a widespread water quality issue in Lake Mempermega. Interesting. Uh, Rick, I think the next question is probably for you, which is about um, metals and landfill leachate, and specifically is if wastewater treatment facilities do a good job removing um, the metals that would be in the leachate. Yes, I think I uh, I don't want to I don't want to speak as a as an expert on wastewater removal, but my knowledge is that uh, much of the metals are absorbed to the sediment in the wastewater facility, and then they're, they're or into the sludge of the sediment. So there is good removal rate on uh, on the priority metals. Right. Uh, and there's also there's also you know significant amount of uh, monitoring that that's in at the wastewater treatment facilities for any for any contaminants that would be of concern. Uh, being discharged that that have a, a potential for exceeding water quality standards and criteria. So when that occurs, uh, monitoring is put in place to ensure that 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 does not happen, both both for all of our industrial and municipal discharges in the state. PFOS is, is the contaminant that's sort of breaking the mold and and that it 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 really does resist getting treated and removed in our wastewater systems. And that's why uh, we're up to the challenge of of treating this a different way and, and making sure that that uh, the amounts of leachate that that pass through a facility are are not too great. Uh, one other point of clarification I'm hoping you might be able to provide. You've mentioned a couple of times about um, urban soils and or or that this is considered an, an urban area. And just uh, can you give a little bit more background on on what that that means and and why sure. it's not unexpected to see some of these contaminants? Yeah, and uh, this is I, I'm pretty sure this is a layer and and studies that the Waste Management Prevention Division did uh, a while back, and and this is uh, to basically have an understanding of what our expectation for soil chemistry is at, at different settings. And in urban settings, there are some contaminants like lead, arsenic, and PAH that are used to to be indicative of whether or not uh, what, what's your expectation for the, the values, the concentrations of those pollutants in the soil. So that if you're doing a remediation project in an urban setting, uh, you know, trying to get it to "Quote unquote background levels." The expectation may be that mm. that that expectation is too great because you're in an urban setting, and they even I think they went out and did studies all all over Vermont, sort of randomized, but also picking urban areas and and taking soil samples 
and recognizing that activities that were even occurring 100 years ago have you know, influenced what the soil chemistry is like today. So what that means is it's sort of like, what is your, you know, what's your ex expected background level at, in an urban environment? We're not talking about a hazardous waste site where, you know, where something more significant happened. We're talking about normal, you know, automobile, wood burning, you know, and, and certainly our past history in the last hundred years, we had gasification plants that might have led to more of these, you know, pollutants being uh, burned or, you know, combustion. And, th and as such, things like lead and, uh, and petroleum uh, hydrocarbons are going to be at higher levels in these areas. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're looking the other way on, on what the potential health risk is. It just means that we're being uh, more realistic about what background levels should expectations should be. Thanks, Rick. That's really helpful. I see we have one more question in the chat and then one person with their their hand up. Uh, the, the question in the chat, Pete, is another one about fish consumption advisories. Um, and I think you spoke to this a little bit, but can you, it, it, whether there is one for Bullhead and Lake Memphremagog and just sort of best practice around fish that, that have uh, some sort of visible illness, whether it's lesions or otherwise. And Pete, Pete, do you want me to just start off with like, I could I could speak to the Vermont General Fish Tissue Advisory. And yeah, go ahead, Rick. It, it might it might not have been clear, but the the evaluation of of the fish tissue from you know, yellow perch, brown bullhead, and largemouth bass from from all of the sites where we sampled. Uh, when I, when we say that some you know trace levels of some pollutants were found, and and that's an expectation for for uh, for fish. Like I said, there's a lot of metals where that's the expectation. A lot of there's trace metals that are actually, you know, good for nutrition as long as they're at the right, the right level. Uh, but the review of that uh, data indicated that the that the Vermont General Fish Tissue Advisory, that's a statewide advisory out for mercury right now, would be protective of of consumption of any of the fish that are in that were in any of the locations where we sample. And that's such that if you look at the, the fish tissue advisory for mercury, like for instance, it's by species. So you'll see yellow perch, and I might get this wrong, but this is just an example. If you're an adult, your yellow perch, you know, you could eat four fish meals a month. And if you can eat up to four eight ounce fish meals a month, that's that means like there's no restrictions. That's there, no advisory would be needed. But if you went and you looked at Women of childbearing age or or children for yellow perch, it might say two fish meals a month. So you can eat two yellow per, you know, two eight ounce yellow perch fish meals a month and not have any risk of of taking in more mercury than you know that would that would pose any additional risk to you. So the vent the the general Vermont fish tissue advisory for mercury would would be protective. And that's basically everybody should be using that for fish that they consume. If you're if you're an adult male, it could be that there won't be any fish consumption restrictions at all for any fish. But you might see that lake trout, you know, it might say limit your or walleye, it might still say limit your fish meals to two eight ounce fish meals a month. And we could we could share that advisory. It's actually going to be updated again in a another year or so with the new uh, data set from uh, fish that were collected from Lake Champlain for mercury analysis. Hmm. Yeah, and the, so it's and kind the, of like it's it's as though the mercury advisory trumps anything that that we see here. It, it would be mm -hmm. it would it would be like a set. There's no need for any additional uh, advisories and a lot of the. Pollutants that we are looking for are not normally looked at like PAHs generally aren't looked at in fish tissue unless there's been a big oil spill or something. And that's because when the fish do take them in, the fish uh, basically excrete any additional PAHs out so that they never they never get up to a high level in them, which is different than, than us talking about brown bullheads being exposed to PAHs in the sediment. 
that's a different type of exposure. You know, they have very dermal skin. But as far as a brown bullhead taking in PAHs in their in their bodies and so forth, they're they're going to metabolize it and they're going to get rid of it. But it's during that metabolism that might cause the hardship for them. That actually is when they metabolize the contaminant, that's when the contaminant exerts its influence on damaging the DNA and 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 have and maybe manifesting itself in it into a tumor or a lesion. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point is that what makes this a, a difficult fish to put a, a further advisory on is that we don't have any evidence that the the analytes that that we would consider putting a, a further restrictive or a, a, a further consumption advisory on, they're not present uh, according to the work that we've done. So, you know, we've we've had discussions with the Department of Health. This wasn't a, a huge sample size. So there was some talk about expanding that um, and getting a larger sample size and, and, and analyzing maybe perhaps more chemicals. But it's very difficult to look at something like PAHs and say we need to put um, uh, a consumption advisory on it because they do metabolize and they excrete this stuff and that still might make the fish sick as it passes through them, but it doesn't mean that there's enough of that that's going to make you sick. So while it is a little unnerving and why we do say, hey, you know, you look at that fish, you see a sick fish, wouldn't recommend eating it. I would say the same thing if you shot a deer, be, be wary of an unhealthy looking animal if you're going to eat it because it might not just be a chemical that you're talking about. It could be viral. It could be a parasite. There are a lot of other things. So we're we're just saying use we don't need to put a, a, a further restriction on this because it, it would potentially give people the false impression that eating perch and other fish from this, you know, salmon, trout from this lake is, is not a good idea. And there's nothing to suggest that that's the case. Recognizing that we're we're just about end of out of time, uh, there was one question just about it, plans for continued study of this issue, um, and I don't know if if either of you want to speak quickly to that. Yeah, we will continue monitoring the the incidence rate. Um, we would like very much to uh, to look at causation to really dig in deeper in a, in a different way than we have so far. We want to look at, we have a lot of genetic uh, tissue samples that have already been run. We want to actually analyze those. This is something that would likely have to be contracted. We don't have a lot of people um, in, in the department or in the agency that can that can do that kind of work. Uh, it's, it's research level work that we would probably have to go to a university or someone like Vicki again at USGS. Um, we also are, there are a couple of other uh, methods that we'd like to try. Uh, and, and there is some a pretty solid amount of research right now that's indicating that a lot of these kinds of things might be viral um, and, and that there is some work that we can do um, in the very near future, I hope, to try to figure this out. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Peggy, I've seen your hand go up and down several times. If you'd like to unmute and ask your, your question to close us out. Thank you, Julie. That's great. Um, just, just to say, I've been reading a lot in the research and around the world, um, when brown bullheads are found with lesions, they are found in contaminated water. And so, um, you know, Pete said earlier that um, the sampling's been done between 2014 and this year, and that 25 to 40% of the sampled fish uh, at least by visual exam, had these lesions. And so it, that seems to say that there is a concern about environmental contamination in the water that is current. And um, I guess, you know, I was the one that made the, I said PCAs instead of PACs. So VOCs, PACs, and PAHs are all implicated in these other places in the world where these lesions occur. And, um, you know, so I just, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're going to be continuing to, to try to figure this out. Yeah. Thank I you. I agree Peggy. with what you said, Peggy. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and the, my, the levels ahead. are certainly higher here than we see in a lot of places throughout the world, Peggy. So it is, it's not a small, percentage it's it's significant and it 
it indicates that something's wrong. What we have had a hard time doing is putting our finger on that. So we're not done trying. We're going to we're going to keep working on this. Thank you. So I would like to uh, close this out here and thank all of you for making time to be part of, of the session this afternoon. Um, I host a discussion about every other month. The next one is scheduled for February 23rd, and it's going to be focused on what I would refer to as the agency's tools and rules uh, that may be of interest to Vermonters looking to build a, a single family home or some other similarly sized construction projects. So hope you will watch for the announcement. I'd like to thank Pete and Rick for their great presentations and their their answers um, to so many questions. Um, if we didn't get a chance to get to you this afternoon, please feel free to, to reach out. Um, maybe Rick, you could flip back to the slide with your contact information at the end. Um, and thank you for joining us this, this evening and wishing you all uh, good health. Thank you.